Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Arthritis at Home. Today, we're going to be looking at the results of Arthritis Consumer Experts' newest national survey. I'm Kelly Lenvoy, VP of Communications and Public Affairs, and I'm joined today by Ellen Wang. Ellen, welcome. Always a pleasure, Kelly. Thank you for having me. So private health insurance, it's, uh, it's really a cornerstone for healthcare access for millions of Canadians, providing coverage for much needed medications, physical therapy, and other essential services. According to the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association, known as CLIA, approximately 60% of Canadians, I'm always amazed by that number, are covered by private health insurance, largely through employer-provided health insurance. I think a lot of us think that uh, people rely in Canada on a public uh, insurance uh, program, but it's actually um, the case that more people are on private. And so today, Ellen, you're joining us because we're going to look, take a deep dive at the national survey um, to sort of explore some key findings on how people living with arthritis are experiencing what their experience is like, um, both the successes and, and some critical gaps in coverage from their private health insurance plans. So to get us started, Ellen, I, um, in terms of looking at these key findings, I thought the first area we'd look at would be ease of reimbursement, which is really, really vital for people living with arthritis, particularly inflammatory uh, arthritis or other chronic diseases where long-term and consistent medication is often necessary. What did we find out about how easy or difficult people found this reimbursement process, selling? Yeah, Kelly, you've made a really good point about, you know, this process, we call it a process because usually there's quite a few steps and it can be complex and it can be really stressful on top of, you know, whatever that individual is already having to deal with, with their rheumatic condition. So the best way to, you know, answer this question wouldn't be a open-ended question. Instead, we used a nine-point scale and we asked participants to rank from very easy, very straightforward to extremely difficult and not straightforward. And you know, we had those options in between. And what we learned was that about three quarters of participants had actually responded that it was either very easy, extremely easy, or easy and straightforward, right? So those individuals had, you can say, less problems navigating the reimbursement process. That said, there's about 25% of participants found it somewhat difficult, difficult, extremely difficult, right? Maybe like about a quarter of those respondents. And you would think to yourself, that's not a lot, but actually when you take that number and extrapolate it across Canada, across all rheumatic conditions, it tends to be quite a bit. So we know that processes are improving, but there's still a lot of work that can be done to make the process not only easier, but more straightforward. So one of the key measures we looked at in terms of people's satisfaction uh, with their private health insurance experience was looking at affordability, Ellen, that we know is a major concern for Canadians living with rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, lupus, or other types of inflammatory arthritis. Um, the cost of medications for these people and the cost of healthcare services is increasing and rising. And so affordability is a real critical issue. We asked people about that. What did we find? You know, we, we really, I think this issue is critical because yes, someone can have health insurance that's covered by their company, right? Their employer, but it doesn't always cover all of the costs or there's a lofty and sometimes 
quite a substantial premium that has to be paid off. So we have to understand that even if someone has health coverage or health insurance coverage, it still can be unaffordable, right? That's that's the thing. And as you stated, things are getting more expensive. A lot of these medications are becoming more expensive. So what we found was about 71% of respondents stated that their monthly premium is affordable. So again, you can think about three quarters. And about 16% stated that their monthly premium is not affordable. Again, 16, you're like, that's not that bad. But that's one in six. That's one in six individuals are having a hard time or finding that their premiums are not affordable. When you when you say one in six, then that you know that hits a little bit different. So it does seem to be and continues to be an issue. Next, we we looked at the this area of uh, impact on arthritis care. So that limited or insufficient coverage that you're describing can force people living with arthritis to have to make some really tough decisions that may affect their ability to manage their disease. What sort of responses did we get when we looked at this key area? So respondents, you know, were asked in this case, what other actions they take or what are the solutions that they seek out to pay for their um, medications. So we listed a number of responses and it seems that, for example, seeking reimbursement from pharmaceutical companies was done but in about 15% of individuals. 12% of individuals had actually noted that they stopped taking prescribed medications, right? And 11% had said they took less of that prescribed medication. So really quite a few, right? That is that is a lot of people when you add those two numbers together. About nine individuals had said, cause them to not fill a prescription and 6% say not to renew a prescription. So we can see that individuals were not adequately reimbursed. They're trying to be creative, but at the end of the day, there's, they're taking less medications or they're not getting that prescription re- refilled, right? Um, a few individuals, so about 6% had said they borrowed money to pay for the medications. Um, and then 2% actually noted that they took medications that were prescribed from some, for someone else. So again, we're seeing the downstream's effect of these high costs. Yeah, I mean, that that's really significant. So, you know, those numbers on their own, you know, if 6% are starting to take a different medication or filling some prescriptions over others, that not, might not seem a, like a lot. But when you take, when you add up all of those different impacts that you just mentioned, and you look at that total number, all of a sudden, that's really, really alarming. And, um, and obviously something that the, the system needs, needs to address, because um, that's a lot of people who are making decisions um, that's going to affect their success in terms of managing their disease. One other area that we looked at, well, a couple of other areas, were this notion about, you know, the experience of de- experiencing delays or declines in coverage. So if there's, you know, a delay in receiving approval, for arthritis medication or facing decline coverage for prescribed uh, medication, it can have a really profound effect, again, on a person's health and quality of life, particularly, again, for people living with inflammatory arthritis, which we know requires timely and consistent access to specific medications to manage symptoms, prevent the progression of disease, and for people to be able to maintain mobility. Really important issue. What did respondents tell us, though? So about 28% of respondents had experienced delays in receiving approval for their arthritis medication coverage. So this is, again, about a quarter of respondents. And most commonly, that delay was around one to four weeks. However, we saw about 26 uh, percent of respondents again, but that one quarter reported delays over five 
weeks to receive the arthritis medication. And 43% had actually experienced moderate impacts because of that delay. Like almost half of our respondents had noted that not only was there delay, but actually had moderate impacts to their health. And about 15% experienced severe impacts. So really, again, like you said, once you add these numbers up, it's no longer just a few individuals. It is really, you know, a lot of people are feeling not only the impacts of the delay in receiving approval, but the delay to be reimbursed. And it is very much so downstream impacts on their health. One of the contributors to delay, as you're describing it, is this process called prior authorization, which is a common requirement from private health insurance plans that's intended to help them control costs by ensuring that prescribed medications are necessary and that um, they follow a specific guideline. Um, did respondents find this prior authorization process a major hurdle uh, for them getting timely access to medications? Yeah, so about 50% have actually reported it being easy or very easy. So about half of our sample said no problems in receiving that prior authorization. However, that means that quite a few individuals, in this case, close to 20%, had noted that it was difficult or very difficult mm -hmm. to receive prior authorization, right? So this is now like one in five individuals. But the I think the most telling statistic here is 13% of individuals didn't even know that they could or had to do this. They didn't even know that prior authorization was an option for them to have, you know, have to minimize their delays. So I think that was the most surprising piece because it's really, again, telling of not only is it difficult for the people who are trying to do it, a lot of people didn't even know that there was that option. Hmm. Now, People who are familiar with the work that um, we've done in our national surveys, they know, Ellen, that one of the things that we look at in terms of sort of go, getting uh, under uh, the broader findings and looking specifically at the experience of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color versus white respondents, often we find significant disparities um, of, of the experiences between those two different populations. Did we find uh, any uh, inequities in access to private health insurance between these two groups in our survey? Kelly, we did find a few rather stark differences, and one of them being, again, the affordability component. So mm -hmm. we found that 33% of BIPOC respondents found that their private health insurance coverage was actually unaffordable. Mm. But when you look at the other end of this, only about 12% of white respondents reported that their health insurance wow. coverage was unaffordable. So 33% and 12%, that's almost three times. And I think if you dig deeper into, you know, try to understand why there are these differences, there's actually no difference in educational attainment or income, right? So I think then it, then we have to you know continue to dig deeper. Like why is it that health private health insurance seems unaffordable or is unaffordable for BIPOC respondents when they seem to be highly educated and they have well paying jobs? Lots and lots of questions for future as well. And did we did we find any other? Uh, areas of health in inequity, such as reimbursement denials or um, knowledge of patient support program assistance? Yeah, so we actually asked participants exactly that about the, the frequency of them being denied for reimbursement for arthritis medications. And we found that it was about twice as high in BIPOC respondents. So BIPOC respondents had a 50% chance of being denied 
for the reimbursement request. So one in two people had been denied compared with, this is 27% of white respondents, so only one in four. So denial rates are incredibly high. And we can again ask ourselves, why is this? Is there a language barrier? Is there you know, difficulties navigating the system for reimbursement? A lot of work to be done. And in terms of uh, two other key elements, Helen, what, what did we find out about the BIPOC uh, respondents' experience with pre-authorization and if they seeked or were aware of the support they could get from patient support programs? So Kelly, we found about 17% of BIPOC respondents received assistance for pre-authorization. This is in stark contrast to 63% of white respondents had received assistance with pre-authorization. Again, this is folds of difference. So 17 versus 63, huge, huge differences. Um, and obviously critical because as we've mentioned before, that prior authorization is a critical step in terms of being able to access much needed medications in a timely way. So what we're looking at is BIPOC respondents may be facing a longer delay or barrier in, in receiving their prescribed medications. And then finally, what about, uh, what about patient support programs? So we found that only about 52% of BIPOC respondents knew about these programs. So only mm. half knew that they were available and that they could be accessed versus 77% of white respondents. So again, we see a stark difference in just the knowledge and the awareness that these resources are even available between BIPOC and white. And as you had alluded to, it could down the line translate into differences or greater delays in medication or you know, health consequences because we didn't know, like BIPOC respondents didn't know that these resources are available or pre-authorization is available. So again, that, uh, that need for information sharing for education, uh, possibly a breakdown with BIPOC respondents not being made aware um, of assistance that they could get uh, when they're when they're dealing with their private health insurance coverage. So a really important finding. And thank you, Ellen, for taking us through uh, these these sort of critical areas. I think we want to remind people at the end of this uh, episode, there'll be links to the report that you're uh, drawing these findings from, Ellen. And in terms of these main areas, um, you know, we've kind of circled around some, some key areas that moving forward, we are going to, to reach out to private health insurers, uh, to employers, uh, to the advisors who are recommending private health insurance plans for, for employers. And I think to, to summarize again, the findings that you described, we're gonna be talking about expanding coverage for arthritis medications, um, really, really important. These are necessary medications. And uh, it's really in some cases uh, for inflammatory arthritis patients, um, critical to be able to deal with their health and disease progression. So really, really important. Um, we're gonna talk to stakeholders about eliminating reimbursement hurdles. Um, people are encountering them. Are there ways to make that process, that navigation as you described it, easier? Um, to make prior authorization more fair and transparent. As you just described, there's a significant number of people who don't understand the process, not aware of how it works. Affordability, we're going to talk to them about, really, really important. Um, you know, whether they get partial or a majority of that premium coverage, um, they're still out of pocket expenses that, uh, that people are facing. 
uh, addressing the health inequities that you identified, Ellen. And I think finally, again, just enhancing communication and education. Um, people need clear, accessible information, it seems to me, about their insurance plans, uh, including how to, to navigate these different uh, processes as, we, as we've described. So, Ellen, thank you again for, for joining us. And thank you to our audience. Uh, really important topic. Um, we're extremely uh, happy that uh, for each of these national surveys, we get the response we get. And I think a special thank you, Ellen, that we extend to everybody who takes the time to fill out these surveys. We want you to know how important that is to us. And as I described in terms of next steps, it informs the work that we do in terms of education, um, the content that we create for our different communications channels, but most importantly, when we are meeting with decision makers and policy makers, we have this firsthand evidence from people living with the disease about what these important topics, um, the, the impact and effect that they have on their everyday lives. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to our viewers. Ellen, I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you, everyone.